King Arthur and His Knights by Maud L. Radford Chapter 20 The Search for the Holy Grail In Arthur's court there were many virtuous knights and ladies, but the best of all was a beautiful maiden, sister to Sir Percival. She was so good that the evil in the world oppressed her, and she could be happy only when she was praying for all people to be made better. Once a good old man told her what was meant by the Holy Grail. Grail, he said, is the word for the cup out of which our Lord Jesus drank, the night that he held the Last Supper with his disciples. Therefore it is called holy. There is a tradition which says that for a long time after the death of Christ the Holy Grail remained on earth, and any one who was sick and touched it was healed at once. But then people grew to be so wicked that it disappeared from earth. It is said that if a person in our day were only good enough, he could see the Holy Grail. "'Really see it?' asked the maiden eagerly. "'Or see it in a vision?' "'I do not know,' answered the good old man. "'But either one would be a great happiness, for a real sight of it, or a vision, would show the person who saw it that he was sinless. Then the beautiful maiden prayed more than ever. She became so thin and pale that it seemed as if she were almost transparent, and at last she lay dying. One morning she sent for her brother Sir Percival, and for his friend Sir Galahad. Sir Percival and Sir Galahad were the two best knights in Arthur's court. They were not so powerful as Sir Lancelot, or Sir Geraint, or Sir Gareth, but they had purer souls than these. When they came to the bedside of the maiden, she said, O oh, my brother and my friend, I have seen the Holy Grail. Last night I was awakened by a sound like the music of a silver horn across the hills. It was more beautiful music than any I have ever heard. Then through my window shone a long, cold beam of silver light, and slowly across that beam came the Holy Grail. It was red like a beautiful rose, and the light reflected from it covered all the walls with a rosy color. And then it vanished. Now I beg you to seek it, and go to the hall of Arthur, and tell all the other knights to take the quest. If they can but see the grail, it will be a sign that they are good, and that the world is growing better. As she spoke, Sir Galahad's face wore an expression so like her own that Sir Percival was amazed. But the maiden took from the side of her bed a sword-belt, and gave it to Sir Galahad. "'Fair knight,' she said, "'I have made this golden belt of my hair, and woven on it, in crimson and silver thread, the device of the Holy Grail. Put on this belt, bind your sword to it, and go forth, for you too shall see the Holy Grail.' Then Sir Galahad and Sir Percival went away quietly, for they saw that the beautiful maiden had not long to live. That night they went to Arthur's hall. The king was absent with the queen, but most of the knights of the round table were there, and to them Sir Galahad and Sir Percival told the vision that Sir Percival's sister had seen. As they spoke, suddenly the torches in the hall were extinguished. There was a loud sound like thunder and a sudden cracking of the roof. Then a beam of light, seven times stronger than day, streamed into the room. Across the beam stole the Holy Grail, but it was covered by a luminous cloud, so that its shape could not be seen. Slowly it vanished away. There was silence in the hall for a long time. The knights were awestruck and could not speak. At last Sir Percival rose in his seat, and said in a low tone, My sister saw the vision of the Holy Grail, but I, because I am more sinful, have seen it covered with a cloud. Yet, because I wish to see it, I vow to spend twelve months and a day in search of it. I will pray, and live as holy a life as I can, and perhaps this vision will be mine. Then Sir Bors, the cousin of Sir Lancelot, made the same vow, as did also Sir Galahad and Sir Lancelot, and Sir Gawain and many others. After the vows had been taken, King Arthur entered. When all had been explained to him, his face grew sorrowful. If I had been here, he said, I should not have allowed you to swear the vow. None of you really saw the grail. You say it was covered with a cloud. Then Sir Galahad cried out, My king, I saw the grail, all crimson like a ruby, and I heard a voice which said, O Galahad, O Galahad, follow me. 
"'Ah, Galahad,' said the king tenderly, "'you were fit for this quest, this search, but the others are not. "'Sir Lancelot is our strongest warrior, but he is not like Sir Galahad. "'Most of you, my knights, are men with strength and will to right wrongs. "'That is the work you are fitted for. "'You have fought in twelve great battles with the heathen, "'but only one of you is fit for this holiest of visions. "'Yet go and fulfill your vow.' The faces of the knights were downcast. The king continued. "'While you are gone, I shall need your strength here at home, but you will be following a wandering fire. Many of you will never return.' All the company felt sad. The next day when the knights departed upon their quest, the king could hardly speak for grief, and many of the knights and ladies wept. Those who had sworn the vow went together to the great gate of the city of Camelot, and there they separated. During the next twelve month, many a poor labourer who had been wronged came to Arthur's court to find a knight who would fight for him, and many a poor widow and maiden. But because so many of the knights of the round table were absent, there was little help to be had, and Arthur's face grew sadder and sadder as time went on. At last, after the twelve month and the day had passed, those in Camelot began to look for the return of the knights who had taken the vow. Alas! though they waited all day long, only Sir Gawain, Sir Bors, Sir Percival, and Sir Lancelot returned. In the evening the knights of the round table assembled in the great hall. When each was seated, the king rose, and said to those who had been upon the quest, My lords, I need only look at your faces, to know that you have fared ill. I dare not think of those of you who have not come back. And now, Percival, my knight who, next to Galahad, has the purest soul, Tell me what has happened to you. Sir Percival rose slowly from his chair, and said, Dear my liege, when I left your court on the sad morning that we all set forth, I did not feel the grief that many of the other knights felt. I had been fighting so well, so many lances had gone down before my stroke, that I was full of confidence in what I could do. I rode happily, planning all the great victories I should win. I was sure if I righted a great many wrongs I should soon see the grail. But after many days I began to grow weary. I was riding through rough forests, and the branches bruised me and my horse. There seemed to be no great deeds to do. I could not even slay wild beasts, and so be of use to the poor country people. My bed was on the hard ground, and my food was wild berries. One day I came to a great castle, and here I decided to rest. When I entered I was warmly greeted and brought to the princess of the castle. I found her to be one whom I had loved long ago in her father's court. I was but a young squire, and she was a great princess, and so I had gone away without telling her how dear I held her. She greeted me kindly, and after a time she began to love me. Soon I wondered whether I was fit to see the Holy Grail. I thought perhaps I was one of those who were pursuing a wandering fire, and then the people of the castle begged me to marry their princess, and be their lord, and live a happy and easeful life. One night I awoke, and thought longingly of the Holy Grail. Whether I were fit to see the vision or not, I had at least sworn to seek it for a year and a day. And yet I had not tried two months. I rose hastily, dressed, and left the castle. Then for many days I prayed and mourned, at last I sought a holy hermit, and told him all I had done and thought since I had left Arthur's court. The good hermit, after a short silence, said, My son, you have not true humility. You have been too proud of your strength, and too sure in the beginning that you were fit for the vision. You have always thought first of yourself and your own glory, and not of the good you could do. I went into the chapel of this hermit, and prayed to be relieved of the sin of pride. As I prayed, Sir Galahad entered. He was clad in silver armor, and his face looked like that of an angel. "'Oh, my brother,' he said, "'have you not seen the grail?' And after I had answered, he said, "'From the moment when I left the court of our king, the vision has been with me. It is faint in the daytime, but at night it shines blood-red.' I see it on the mountains, and in the lakes, and on the marshes. It has made me so strong that everywhere I am able to do good. I have broken down many evil customs, 
I have fought with pagan hordes and been victor, all because of this blessed vision. Percival, I have not long to live. I am going to the great city above, which is more beautiful than any earthly city. Come out with me this night, and before you die, you shall see this vision. Then I followed Sir Galahad out of the chapel. We climbed a hill which was steep and rugged, Sir Galahad going first, and his silver armor guiding me. When we came to the top, a storm broke over us, and the lightning seemed to follow us as we descended the hill on the other side. At the bottom of it there was a great black swamp, leading to the sea. It was crossed by a huge bridge built by some forgotten king. Here Sir Galahad left me, and ran over the bridge till he reached the sea. His armor shone like a star, far away at the edge of the water, and then I saw him no more. I knelt on the black ground and wept, and wished that I were as good as Sir Galahad, and could do deeds as he did, not to win glory, but to help those who needed help, and as I wept I was aware of a great light over me. I looked up and saw a silver beam, and across it slowly moved the Holy Grail. It was no longer muffled in a cloud, but shone, crimson as a ruby. I made my way back to the chapel and prayed all the rest of the night. In the morning I found Sir Galahad's body by the sea. He was beautiful as a saint, though he was worn and thin from long self-sacrifice. I buried him, and then turned my steps to Camelot. And now, my Lord Arthur, I shall never fight again. I shall become a monk and pass my life in prayer as my sister did. Among my brother monks there will be very many little deeds of service I can do. Thus I will spend my life. All the knights were very much moved, and the king looked affectionately at Sir Percival, but he did not speak to him. He turned to Sir Gawain and said, Sir Gawain, was this quest for you? Then Sir Gawain, always light-hearted and easily turned away from one thing to another, said, Nay, my king, such a search is not for one like me. In a little time I became tired. I talked to a holy man, who told me that I was not fit for such a vision. So I journeyed till I came to a field with silk pavilions, and very many knights and ladies, and with them I lived happily for the year. The good king looked displeased, but his face grew tender as he turned to Sir Bors. Bors, he said, good, faithful, and honest you have ever been. Tell me what you have seen. Sir Bors, who stood near Sir Lancelot, said, my lord Arthur, after I had started on the quest, I was told that madness had fallen upon my kinsman, Sir Lancelot. This so grieved me that I had but little heart to seek for the Holy Grail. Yet I sought for it. I believed that if God meant me to see the vision, he would send it. I travelled till I came to a people who were heathen. They knew much of magic, but nothing of God. I stayed with them and tried to teach them our faith, but they were angry because I would not believe in their gods, and they put me into prison. I was there many months in darkness and cold, but I tried to be patient, and prayed that my patience would count for something, although I could not do any good deeds. I had at least been faithful, though I failed. One night a stone slipped from my prison wall, and I could see a space of sky with seven stars set across it. Then slowly across the space glided the Holy Grail. My happiness was great, for I had seen the vision. The next morning a maiden who had been secretly converted to our religion released me from prison, and I came hither. Then the king spoke to Sir Lancelot. My Lancelot, the mightiest of us all, have you succeeded in this quest? Then Sir Lancelot groaned. O king, he cried, your mightiest yes, and yet far better it would be if I were like Sir Galahad. A great sin is on my soul, and it was to be rid of this sin that I undertook the quest of the Holy Grail. A hermit told me that only by putting this sin away should I ever see the vision. I strove so hard against it that my old sickness came upon me. I became mad and rode up and down among waste places, fighting with small men who overthrew me. The day has been when the very sound of my name would have made them tremble. At last I came to the sea, and saw a boat anchored near the shore. I stepped into it, loosed the anchor, and floated away. 
For seven days I sailed, and at last I came to an old castle. I entered and heard a voice singing. I followed it up, up for a thousand steps. At last I came to a door, which burst open before me. Perhaps I dreamed, and yet I believe I saw the Holy Grail, though it was veiled and guarded by great angels. I thought I saw all this, and then I swooned away. When I came to myself I was alone in the room. It was many days before I made my way back to Camelot. For a long time there was silence in the hall, and then Sir Gawain said, Sir King, I can fight, and I always shall fight for you. But I do not believe in this vision. All the knights were mad, like Sir Lancelot. They did not really have the vision. It was but fancy. Then the king spoke gravely to Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain, you are indeed not fit for such a vision, but you should not doubt that others have seen it. I was right, my knights, when I said that most of you would follow a wandering fire. How many of those who left me have not returned, and never will? The knights looked at the empty chairs. The king went on. Sir Galahad was the only one who completely saw the vision. He was indeed blessed and fit for such a quest. You who were unfit should have stayed with me to help govern this land. The knights were silent and sad. Then the king said, My dear knights whom I love, always remember this, whether you seek for a vision, or do humble service as Sir Percival will for his fellow monks, or fight to right wrongs as Sir Lancelot does, whatever you do your aim must be to make yourself useful to the world by the work for which you are best fitted. The king rose from the round table, and left company, and left the company, Sir Lancelot following him. Then the other knights departed, one by one. The great hall was left empty, with its shields glimmering in the moonlight.